Intel's new Core Ultra 200 series based on the Arrow Lake architecture doesn't have the greatest gaming performance. In our reviews of the Core Ultra 9 to 5K and the Core Ultra 5 to 5K, we found that these chips overall have about the same gaming performance as their predecessors, the Core i9 14900K and the Core i5 14600K, respectively. Some have been making theories about why this is the case, especially since Air Lake is faster in pretty much every other area. One of these theories is that it's all down to a CPU core scheduling issue. As far as I can tell, this theory originates from CapFrameX, who develops a frame rate logging tool by the same name and is an active member of the PC hardware community. So here's the brief explanation on CPU scheduling. Modern CPUs have multiple cores, but it doesn't always make sense to assign tasks to random cores. Some cores can achieve a higher clock speed than others. Sometimes cores can be very different architecturally, and on some processes, there are cores that communicate fast with some cores, but slower with others. That's why Windows has a complex scheduling algorithm in order to give workloads the cores that are best suited for them. So you'll have Core 0 as the primary core, and then Core 1, Core 2, Core 3, and so on. Over the years, AMD and Intel have collaborated with Microsoft to make Windows more robust at scheduling. For instance, back in 2017 when AMD launched the first Ryzen CPUs, scheduling became more important than ever due to a critical design feature. Each Ryzen processor was made up of two core complexes with four core each, and it took a while for cores in one complex to talk to the other. So it was much better for Windows to make sure, whenever possible, that applications would only use cores within one core complex, assuming it didn't need more cores than that for maximum performance. AMD needed Microsoft to improve the scheduler to be aware of this design quirk with Ryzen. Intel also found itself in a similar position when it launched its 12th gen Alder Lake CPUs. The higher end models were the first desktop chips from Intel to feature two distinct kinds of cores, high performance P cores and efficiency geared E cores. Obviously, you want the P cores to be used for applications where performance matters, so sending tasks to cores at random would be a bad idea. Hence, Intel introduced ThreadDirector, which is supposed to make sure P cores are used first and that E cores are used last or for background tasks and for other workloads where performance isn't a big deal. So the theory goes that CPU scheduling is broken on Air Lake and that it's ruining performance in games. But that might be confusing since Air Lake has the same P core and E core configuration as Raptor Lake. What's so different between Air Lake and older processors? In this tweet, CapFrameX argues that CPU scheduling was broken by putting the E-Core clusters in between the P-Cores. Here's how they look on the top-end Aerolake die with 8 P-Cores and 16 E-Cores. Now, this is what it looks like on the top-end Alder Lake die, with P-Cores on one side and E-Cores on the other. And this is Raptor Lake for the top-end 13th and 14th gen models, which similarly has the P-Cores in their own corner and the E-Cores in their own. On Alder Lake and Raptor Lake, the order of the cores always went through all the P cores before reaching E cores. So in the case of the 14900K, cores 0 to 7 were the P cores, and then 8 to 23 were the E cores. Windows sees that you're trying to run a game or some kind of other performance focused app, it's going to populate cores 0 to 7 first, and maybe even refuse to use other cores which are the E cores if it thinks it'll reduce performance. But on Air Lake, if you're counting from the top down, cores 0 and 1 are P cores, but then cores 2 to 9 are E cores. The idea is that the Windows scheduler or applications are programmed to think that cores 0 to 7 are the best cores, but in Air Lake they're not. This causes performance problems in games, and hence Air Lake's poor gaming performance might be because of scheduling errors. That the order of the cores has changed seems to be confirmed. PC hardware enthusiast and engineer Nemes showed what Task Manager displayed when running a workload only on the 265K's 8 P cores. If cores 0 to 7 were P cores, then all of these cores at work should be right next to each other, but they're not. However, if we follow the Arrow Lake core layout, then what Task Manager says makes perfect sense. We have our first two P cores, and then we have four E cores, which are idle, and then four disabled E cores that won't show up on Task Manager and then four P cores, and then eight idle E cores, and then finally the last two P cores. But does this really mean that Arrow Lake's gaming performance is reduced due to faulty CPU scheduling? Personally, I was a bit skeptical when I read this, especially since the numerical ordering of the cores doesn't seem like a complicated thing for Windows to deal with. So I decided to put this theory to the test by benchmarking my 285K and 245K with all the E cores disabled. This means that Windows can't possibly screw up and give an important task to any of the E cores since they're all turned off. 
even before this recent talk about CPU scheduling on Arrow Lake, there have been concerns ever since 12th gen Alder Lake that eCores actually reduce gaming performance. So this will be a useful test to see if things have improved since then. As always, we're testing our Arrow Lake CPUs in the LGA 1851 test bench, powered by ASRock Z890 Lightning, a 32 gigabyte kit of DDR5 memory, clocked at 6,000 megahertz and given CL36 timings, and Corsair's H70i IQ Link cooler with the 420 millimeter radiator. We also have performance data from our LGA 1700 and AM5 test benches, which only differ in respect to the motherboards and the memory, a 32 gigabyte kit of DDR5 running at 5600 megahertz and CL46 timings. All test benches are using the 24H2 update for Windows 11, and we disabled application optimization on the Intel CPUs. To disable the eCores, we just went into the BIOS and selected the option that disables the eCores. We only did gaming benchmarks for this video, largely because it's obvious that we see a pretty substantial decline in performance in applications that rely on multiple cores, like Cinebench 2024. So this will be a little shorter than usual. Anyways, let's have a look at the results. Starting off with Total War Three Kingdoms at 1080p, we can see that disabling the eCores does improve performance on the 2A5K by a decent amount, though the 245K doesn't benefit too much. With the settings cranked up, the 2A5K is still faster without those eCores, but the 245K loses quite a few frames in the 99th percentile, and it's the worst performing CPU. Disabling eCores in Counter-Strike 2 at 1080p doesn't seem to really do much for performance. This is a somewhat inconsistent game to benchmark, so don't read too much into how the 245K performed with and without eCores. It's a wash at 1440p as well, unsurprisingly. In Civilization 6, we can see that disabling the eCores was a big mistake. The 2A5K was the fastest CPU with eCores enabled, but it dropped significantly after we turned them off. Similarly, the 245K went from third to last and performed way worse than even the 14600K. It's basically the same story of 1440p, even though the GPU was more of a bottleneck than before. City Skylines 2 is also a game where turning off eCores is a bad idea. The 2A5K and 245K performed decently with them enabled, but are firmly in last place without them at 1080p. The 2A5K can sort of hang in there at 1440p even with disabled eCores, but it's all over for the 245K, which had a very poor frame rate in both the average and the 99th percentile. Disabling eCores seems to help the 245K a little in Dota 2 at 1080p, but it does nothing for the 2A5K. At 1440p, there's hardly any difference whether the eCores are on or off, even for the 245K. The 2A5K doesn't seem to perform any differently in Dirt 5 whether it has eCores or not, but the 245K seems to lose a bit of performance when they're disabled. At 1440p with the ultra high preset, it becomes GPU bottlenecked and so all CPUs perform pretty much the same. Benchmarks in Minecraft can be fairly inconsistent, so while we do see the 245K gaining performance after turning off the eCores, it's hard to say if we're looking at a genuine performance boost or if it's just noise. The 285K doesn't seem to have gained any performance at least. If we're just looking at the average frame rates, turning off eCores didn't do any good for performance at 1440p, but the 245K clearly has a better 99th percentile frame rate when the eCores are enabled. Rainbow Six Siege is another game where turning off eCores causes big performance losses. The 2A5K loses exactly 100 frames per second in the average, and the 245K loses over 80. The margins shrink at 1440p, but not so much that they disappear. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, disabling eCores loses a little performance on both the 285K and the 245K. It's not a dramatic loss, but it's clearly there. The performance loss becomes especially acute for the 245K when we switch to 1440p, especially in the 99th percentile frame rate. Last up is The Witcher 3, and at 1080p with the low preset running, we see that the 2A5K gains quite a bit of performance when the eCores are disabled, and it nearly catches the 7800X3D in the average frame rate. The 245K, however, is significantly faster if its eCores are enabled. But at 1440p with the RT Ultra preset, both the 2A5K and the 245K lose lots of frames if their eCores are turned off. The 2A5K actually goes from first place to fifth, which is pretty sad. So let's tally up the results. There were three games where we observed any performance improvement by switching off the eCores, either at 1080p with the low graphic settings or 1440p with high graphic settings. And then there were five games where there was no or little performance impact regardless of the graphic settings used, though this could have been due to GPU bottlenecking. Finally, there were five games where to save in the eCores actually had a noticeably negative impact on gaming performance in one or both of the graphics configurations. 
Notably in The Witcher 3, disabling the E cores at 1080p with the low preset yielded more performance, but when we cranked it up to 1440p with the RT Ultra preset, it was the stock 285K and 245K that came out on top compared to the E coreless chips. The 245K performed especially poorly when its E cores were disabled, and while I was benchmarking it, I noticed that it had unusually high CPU usage, around 90% in some cases. Now obviously, if you go around and disable a bunch of cores on a CPU, it's going to have less overall horsepower, so this is not too surprising. But another factor that made the 245K so slow without its E cores is a lack of hyperthreading. Intel removed hyperthreading on all of its latest CPUs, so the 245K without its E cores is a 6 core CPU with just 6 threads. Even the Core i5-12400, Intel's value 6-core CPU, has 12 threads thanks to hyperthreading. So we probably can't evaluate this whole CPU scheduling theory with the 245K's performance data since it mostly just indicates that Intel's latest CPUs can perform really poorly if they don't have any E-cores. Thankfully, the 285K's 8P core seems efficient as far as I can tell. CPU usage was still relatively high, but it never climbed into the 90s. If CPU scheduling was a problem in Air Lake, then we would have seen more games where disabling the E-cores improved performance. However, we can definitely say that the 285K is better with E-cores than without, and the 245K especially so. That E-cores improve performance more frequently than they reduce it is a clear sign that CPU scheduling is working mostly as intended on Air Lake. In games like Civilization VI and Rainbow Six Siege, we can imagine that the P-cores are completely pinned to the game, while background stuff is being processed on the E-cores. So, if CPU scheduling isn't to blame for Arrow Lake's middling gaming performance, then what is? Here's my own theory. Intel's original plan for the desktop seems to have been Otter Lake, then Meteor Lake, then Arrow Lake, but things obviously changed at some point. We know these CPUs were released later than intended due to delays with Intel's 10 nanometer and 7 nanometer nodes, which are now Intel 7 and Intel 4 respectively. In order to keep releasing new CPUs in a timely manner, Intel needed a new CPU to slot between Otter Lake and Meteor Lake, or even replace Meteor Lake entirely. In the end, Intel basically tries to recreate the top-end Meteor Lake or Arrow Lake chip using the Alder Lake architecture, which means increasing the amount of E-cores from 8 to 16 and adding more L2 cache. That's basically what Raptor Lake is. Now, Raptor Lake is not designed for power efficiency or space efficiency, but raw horsepower, and it's definitely very good at delivering that. That's partly thanks to Intel's increasing experience with the 10 nanometer node, as Raptor Lake is technically the fourth or fifth 10 nanometer CPU. As the 10 nanometer node became more refined, it became easier to hit higher clock speeds at acceptable power levels, something that helped Intel get the performance boost it needed. However, while Intel had plenty of time to refine Raptor Lake and make it into a CPU that punches above its weight, that wasn't the case with Air Lake. Air Lake is Intel's second tile-based CPU, and it marks the first time that they've ever fabbed CPU cores at an external foundry. Intel didn't make TSMC's 3 nanometer node, obviously, and I'm sure their CPU design team has relatively little experience with TSMC's processes, let alone the 3 nanometer node. So, Intel is forced into making a refined version of Otter Lake that actually turns out really well, much better than they might have even expected, and then they have to follow that up with a new CPU using new and complex technology that's fabbed on a node that Intel didn't even design for the very first time. That's an incredibly tough situation to be in. Honestly, Intel did pretty well considering the circumstances. Arrow Lake clearly has more raw CPU horsepower than Raptor Lake, and it's also significantly more efficient. But since Raptor Lake clocks higher than Arrow Lake, and since many games love high clock speeds, it can be really hard for the Core Ultra 200 series to compete with 14 gen at times. And there might be other teething issues with Arrow Lake, but CPU scheduling doesn't appear to be one of those. Basically, it's hard to follow up really refined technology that worked with a long time with something new and complex and even innovative. I'm sure you can think of a product or project that was also troubled thanks to using new technology. So, if I were you, I would keep those E-cores enabled on your Core Ultra 200 series CPU. They're actually really useful, and they will probably help improve gaming performance in your experience. Anyways, that's the video. If you enjoyed our benchmarking and analysis, then please like the video, leave a comment, subscribe, and click the bell icon to get notified the next time we upload. Our next video is going to be about power efficiency on Arrow Lake, so stay tuned for that. If you really like what we do and want to support us financially, check out our Patreon. A link is in the description. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.